Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part two of Books Are My Disease, a two-part series exploring the Loganian Library. I'm Emily Guthrie, and I'm joined here today by Laura Keim, curator at Stenton, which is James Logan's home in Germantown. And on my right is Jim Green, librarian emeritus of the library company. I think many of you tuned in last week uh, for part one, and in that in that part, Jim and Laura gave a video tour of Stenton that took a close look at how Logan stored and used his large book collection within his home. If you missed part one, you can always catch it on the library company's YouTube channel, along with recordings of many other library company events. So today is part two. We're, we're going to take a closer look at what happened to Logan's books after they left Stenton and became the official Loganian Library and then part of the library company. What, we'll talk about what the Loganian Library looked like, who used it, who was allowed to use it, and what some of the rules were. And of course, we're going to explore a selection of books from the collection that highlight the ways in which Logan acquired his books and how he read and responded to them. So let's go ahead. I'm going to start uh, my slideshow and look at some images of the original Loganian library. So bear with me just a moment. Oops. Okay. All right, we'll get it to the beginning here. <laughs> Okay, so here <clears throat> on the screen, we have two views of the purpose-built Loganian Library, which was on 6th Street in Philadelphia and opened in the year 1760. On the left is an original ink and wash drawing of the building, as well as some other Philadelphia landmark buildings. So the Loganian Library at the top, uh, some rendering of Stenton in the bottom center. Um, which thinks Stenton is taller than it really is. Right. We don't. Laura, Laura, and I were talking about this earlier, and it's not quite the accurate uh, rendering of of Stenton. Um, we also have uh, so that the ink and wash drawing was done in 1797, and I don't think we know the the artist on that. And okay, and this is part of the collection of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. On the right is another version of what the Loganian Library possibly looked like. But if you compare these two images on the screen, you see that, that there are a few differences, including the number of bays across the, the front facade. Meaning the number of windows. Number of windows, yes. So um, the image on the right comes from a book on the history of public libraries that was published in, in 1876. And I, if I can jump in, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know when that original building was torn down, but I, I, I'm quite sure it wasn't standing in, in 1876. So it's an imaginary, imaginary view, possibly even from memory. But the, um, the, the original building had, when that, when that watercolor was done, had been, it had been vacated and um, sold to a merchant named John Swanwick for 700 pounds. And I guess it was still standing in some, possibly still standing in 1799, but probably not much later. Okay. And Jim, I, I think last week, week you mentioned the dimensions of the building as, as part of, yes. so Logan designed this building and he was very meticulous as he was about everything about the dimensions, making sure that all of his books would fit in there neatly. I think you said it was 64 feet across. Yes. Um, yeah, long ago, I calculated that, uh, that in order to hold all the, the books in the Logan, the formal Logan Library, as reconstructed by Edmund Wolf, you would need about 64 running feet of, of uh, shelves, shelves. And then I found out after I'd done that, <laughs> that the, <laughs> the building was 64 feet wide, which makes me think that um, it was meant to hold all the books against the back wall um, that is far away, far away from the windows, but still um, probably, it was probably a fairly shallow building as well. So. Okay, so you'd walk in the front door and you would see the expanse of books directly the on the wall. Thing. Must have okay. been great. <laughs> <laughs> like going shopping. 
So there are a few rules about using the newly built Loganian library and who could run it and who could use the collections and when they could access it. So uh, to my understanding, only Logan's eldest male heirs uh, could serve as librarian. And those individuals had to have learned at least some of the books of Virgil and could be able to translate Erasmus into English. So that's that's changed a bit. Um, the librarian or his deputy was to attend the library every Saturday from 3 to 7 p.m. in the summer. And so long as one may see to read in the winter. All residents of Pennsylvania who were educated in reading and writing, especially in Latin, or who studied any of the mathematical sciences or medicine, or by the librarian's favor, any other British subject could be admitted on Saturdays or any other day on which the librarian basically cared to open the doors. <laughs> and those people meeting those descriptions could also borrow the books. The borrowing periods at this time seem to depend on the format of the book. So a folio could be checked out for three weeks, a quarto for two, an octavo for one week, and you'll see in a moment that the borrowers had, borrowers had to sign a promissory note that reflected the value of the book or sometimes more. And Laura and I were talking earlier about why the different borrowing periods for the different size of book. And the most logical explanation seemed to be that folios are bigger and would take, take longer, longer to read. read. <laughs> but it doesn't really work, does it? Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> taste good to size. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. I don't think that rule stuck around for very long. Well, no, I think that it, the, in the regular library company, they did also have different uh, loan periods for different formats of books. And yeah, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's pretty arbitrary. <laughs> Let's try this on for size. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're seeing here is a watercolor painting um, that was done in the 19th century of uh, the interior of the Loganian Library at the period in time when it had joined forces with the Library Company of Philadelphia and was given an annex off of the side of the east side of the Library Company's building at Fifth and Library Streets. So which is actually, the, it looked like the building that's now the reproduction building is the APS. That's the right. Philosophical design. Yeah. So you could almost imagine this like being a back wing on the original core of that American Philosophical Society. Yes. Building. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, we're going to show another image that shows a different view into this space. So I want everyone to pay attention to this archway here, which is a, a gothic arch on this side. And on the flip side is just a, a normal classical round. Classical, classical round arch. Other things to note about this, this watercolor painting, um, well, A, people are using the Loganian Library, which, you know, is good to see. That guy in the lower right, though, is he reading He's anything? I think he's sleeping. He's sleeping. It looks like <laughs> <laughs> um, but we think that on, it might be hard for viewers to see, but on this ground level, you have the books in cases that have a wire front enclosure. Perhaps to, to keep the researchers or patrons from, from grabbing them without the librarian's assistance. We think that these shelf shelving uh, gradations or sequence of sizes probably corresponds to uh, the shelving strategy that you hi highlighted last week at, um, at Stenton. So we have the folios right here, which are shelved upright on the bottom. And then of course, the smallest, smallest duodecimos up on top. So that system um, was maintained and still maintained to some extent. This is a really wonderful painting that was done around 1880 by the artist George Bacon Wood. So it shows the library company side of the Loganian Library. So here's the, the classical arch and that forms the doorway from the library company into the Loganian Library. So in order to 
welcome and accommodate the Loganian Library. The Lo library company knocked a hole in the wall of the east side of their building and created this arch. And it looks like the librarian's desk provided the librarian access to both sides. So they could work kind of both sides of the room. They could serve the patrons on the library company side of things, and they could turn around and check on the Loganian library as well. What else do we see in this image? <laughs> we see James Logan. A portrait of a James, portrait Logan, James Logan, Logan centered at the top of the arch and a portrait of Stenton. Yes. Actually. Yeah. It's actually it's in right place off to our right. Yes. The, <laughs> if we could pan to the right, <laughs> you'd see a gigantic painting, yeah. painting of Stenton. So if we go back one slide. Whoops, maybe we can't go back, ever go back. <laughs> and didn't you say, Jim, that was Lloyd P. Smith, Lloyd Pearsall oh, Smith? You. Yes. Yeah. Yes, That's as the portrait, librarian. Portrait of the, the Logan descendant, Lloyd Smith. And um, his friend Anne Hampton Brewster, who was, and we know that it was Anne Hampton Brewster because she was the only library company shareholder who had the privilege of bringing her dog into the library. Oh, yeah. I wonder yeah. how that came to be. I would yeah. like to bring you because know. she was <laughs> because she was friends with the librarian. <laughs> it's, worth a, it's worth a lot. To be a librarian. <laughs> so um I think that's all we wanted to say about that one. Just, just an aside. Um, the the Loganian Library merged with the Library Company on May first, seventeen ninety four, and at this point, the Loganian Library collection had grown to just over three thousand titles, in close to four thousand volumes. There is a fun account uh, from a visitor who who was visiting from England. He was in America actually for a few years, beginning around 1798. And when he visited Philadelphia, he wanted to visit the Loganian Library on his very first morning in the city. And he wrote about, not about his observations of the physical space or any books that he consulted during that visit, but his uh, admiration of Logan's portrait that was hanging on the wall. And here's what he wrote about that. Mm. I could not exp not repress my exclamations. As I am only a stranger, said I, in this country, I affect no enthusias enthusiasm on beholding the statues of her generals and statesmen. I have left a church filled with them on the shore of Albion that have a prior claim to such feeling. But here I behold the portrait of a man whom I consider so great a benefactor to literature that he is scarcely less illustrious than its munificent patrons of Italy. And that was an English visitor named John Davis. So I think that is the effect that Logan would have wanted. Would have wanted. <laughs> it's just <laughs> So this is the Loganian Library's second to most recent home. It's of course today here with us in the Ridgeway building on at the intersection of 13th and Locust. Um, but before being here, it was at the Ridgeway building at the intersection of Broad and Christian Streets, less than a mile away from here, I would say, in a large neoclassical building that uh, was opened in 1878. So this is a view of the enormous reading room and the Loganian library would have been found on the balcony level. So it's possible that the oak cases with their wire front um, uh, doors could have been transferred or salvaged from the original library building um, or perhaps shored up or, or new ones were purpose built for, for this new space, but it's fun to see them kind of uh, in this new space reimagined. And um, if you if you turn this picture 180, uh, 180 degrees, um, you would see the, the main reading room desk, the same kind of desk that Lloyd Smith was sitting at and painting that we just saw. And then steps, instead of the little steps that going back into the Loganian library um, that we saw before, the, the, this room had 
very, very monumental steps going all the way up to the balcony, but, but the reading room desk actually blocked the steps. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever go to Stenton, you can see uh, sort of the Loganian Memorial. The Loganian Memorial, which Laura was explaining earlier, lived on, on the steps. On, like, on the landing, on just the landing. outside this building. Oh, okay, outside. Beginning in 1939. Okay, all right. Yeah. So another fun fact about the Ridgeway building was that at this point in time, the library company had, had two locations. So as plans were being drawn up and arguments were being had over whether we needed this Ridgeway building and where it should be and what it should look like. Another uh, branch of the library was, was built and designed by Frank Furness um, that used to be at the intersection of Juniper and Locust, right? Caddy corner uh, from where we are now. So how, they, how did they decide which books went to which location? Well, this Ridgeway building we see on the screen um, received all of the library company collections that dated before 1856, as well as the Loganian Library. And then the Juniper and Locust location received the more popular um, modern, modern materials. And this location has a reputation for being underused, so. So now we're gonna jump into some highlights from the Loganian Library and documents relating to uh, its description in, in cataloging. So what we have here on the screen is the very first catalog, a manuscript catalog of the Loganian Library that Logan commissioned his son-in-law, Isaac Morris, to create in 1741. I noticed that the date uh, that we have on this is 1741 to 1742, which I wondered if that was an indication that it took Isaac Norris that long to kind of mm -hmm. to write this down. <laughs> no, I think it means we don't actually know. <laughs> okay, okay, Sometime approximately. Yeah. There actually, um, I, I'm I'm not positive about this, but I think there are some books in there that that are recorded in Logan's own hand uh, in the book as having been acquired uh, after uh, it, it plays as 1744. So that's another possible date for um, Isaac Norris compiling this catalog. But no, no, I don't okay. think it took him two years or four years to, okay. to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has a very neat hand. We'll see a close up of it on the, on the next slide. But we wanted to show you the outside of the volume as well, which you see on the left. And Laura, you can hold it up if you'd like. We have it here in person as well. So it's it's quite large, um, 14 inches along the spine. Yeah, I think it was, it was even more, maybe. I don't know if we can read the ruler, but 16. Yeah. 16, yeah. okay. And we're calling it a half ledger? No. No? <laughs> it's a, a day book, a day book a day shape book. of a, a very standard. I, I, just as we were starting this program, I looked behind me and saw that we have another similar manuscript volume. Um, just sitting here on the shelf. I don't remember why it's here. But <laughs> so it was a very common kind of, of thing you could get from any stationer. Um, and it was ruled for um, probably for use as a, a day book. Okay. So, all in all, this manuscript catalog records 990 titles in 1272 volumes. The catalog is organized by subject. And then within each subject by, by format or size, um, folio, quarto, octavo, octavo, et cetera. So let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. So on the left is just a detail of one of the pages. Um, and you can see the title for this section is Libri Orientalis Quarto. And his Libri Orientalis would have been books such as such as the Quran, um, books of so-called Asian 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 origins. Well, yeah, books in Hebrew, Arabic. Hebrew, yeah. Okay. In and the quarto size. In the quarto size. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and then on the right, uh, I can't quite see the the title of this section, but I picked it out because it at the very top you'll see. 
the notation of Newton's Principia, which we're going to be talking about a bit later, and you'll note that it's a, a quarto size. Yeah, this this category was called uh, books of arithmetic. Books of arithmetic. Okay. Arithmetic guide. Okay, great. So why is why is this manuscript catalog interesting and important? Um, it is a record of Logan's core collection, his core holdings, and the books that you know he collected before he knew or had really conceived of giving his library to the city and rebranding it as the Loganian Library, at which point, as you talked about last week, he really uh, accelerated his collection development, adding more titles to the collection to kind of prepare it to be uh, received and useful to the public. So these 990 titles, uh, again, are, are a really strong record of the books that Logan very deliberately collected and the ones that he is more likely to have written in and, and responded to the text. It's also thought that seeing this, seeing his collection kind of in writing and described in this way uh, really solidified his interest in turning it over to the public as the Loganian Library. And maybe it was something about um, just seeing, you know, all of his books come together in, in one volume and, and seeing the breadth of his collection and what it could possibly mean to, to the public. And, and for those of you who were uh, tuned into part one, um, looking at this catalog, which is so beautifully um, written and, and without any insertions or crossings out, um, it makes me think that it was um, that it was actually just a shelf list, just the books on the shelves in the main part of the library, which we believe was in the, the office on the first floor, just inside the main door of Stenton. And, um, and it has nine categories. Um, the, the Oriental books is one category, the arithmetic books are another, and general classics and theology and so forth. Um, and those were the, the, those were the parts of the library that Logan was proudest of, always referred to um, his library when he was characterizing it to people, he would say, and I have, you know, um, collections in this area, in this area, in that area. At the, on the last couple of pages of this catalog, though, um, um, Isaac Norris began some other categories um, in, in a very, very um, much less systematic way compared to the ones you're looking at here. And they, they were... Uh, things like books in Spanish, which um, Logan didn't have very many of, and probably, I'm guessing, did not have in that room. But it, it looks to me as if, as if Isaac Norris was trying to continue the catalog, but then just kept running into the problem of where are all these books and how do I, <laughs> they're, they're in different parts of the house and they may not even be grouped together the way they are grouped together so neatly in the office. So I think it was when he got to, through those nine categories, through the ones that were in the office, that Norris um, gave up. He just threw up his hand and said, no, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and um, at some point, we know from the um, the executor's report after Logan died, that there were there were plural catalogs, the catalogs of the library. And I think, and this is not something that um, Edwin Wolf would agree with, I don't, I think he thought that, this, that the catalogs were um, destroyed or lost. But I think that this one that we have here is probably the first of those catalogs and mm -hmm. that um, others were made of other parts of the library that might have been in other parts of the house. And those mm -hmm. are the ones mm -hmm. that or those other catalog or catalogs are, that are lost. And then the, the other um, way the executors appraised the library was by referring to, um, to invoices, which I believe were, um, were um, just booksellers' bills for large, some of the large um, um, purchases that Logan made in the last couple of years of his life. And those are those are books that um, possibly never even got on the shelves and may mm -hmm. even have been um, still in their original boxes. Oh, wow. I mean, the last two orders he made were for 300 and 500 books from two different okay. bookstores. Oh, gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Book maniac. <laughs> OK. This is something that that I I think is so much fun. This uh, is the library loan book, the Loganian library loan book, and there's also a, 
a version of this for the library company's uh, other collections. So this is a book that um, was kept between 1794 and 1836, and it was kind of designed and printed by Zachariah Poulsen, who was the librarian at the time. It's the only record we have of books that were borrowed from the late Loganian Library. And of course, it doesn't account for books that were used on site or, or in-house. So you can see that it's a bit of an odd looking book. It's a bit of an odd format and parts of the pages have been cut out in kind of a systematic and repetitive way. And there's quite a bit of writing in it too. So each page uh, is made up of four, are we calling them promissory notes? Sure. Promissory yeah. notes, mm -hmm. which uh, ask a borrower to do what just what it says here on the screen. So the borrower had to, borrower had to promise to pay the trustees of the Loganian Library the sum of what we think was tw twice the value of the book specie for value received where of, and then deposit, they had to put on, I'm messing this up. So they had to put down a deposit of that amounted to the value of the book. And if they failed to return the book in a timely fashion, or if they defaced the book in any way or lost it, then they would owe the, the library twice the, the value of the book or twice the amount they put down on deposit. This is a very familiar, um, uh, mechanism for borrowing anything really if you if you borrow money um you would fill out a, a form that was much like this that would say um that if you fail to repay the debt in time that you would then be indebted for twice the, the that quantity and it's called double indemnity which is a phrase that i think is familiar to a lot of people but maybe not uh, under may not have understood exactly what it meant but it means that that if you borrow something and don't return it then you have to basically replace it, with, replace it. If you can't replace it, then you have to, uh, you're in debt for twice the value of the thing that you borrowed, or twice the amount that you borrowed. Sure, anyway, so, so take good care of it. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it back. Yeah. Here's a closer, closer view of one of the promissory notes. So what you see scratched out, uh, excised is, is the title of the book. Um, and then, so that's the front of the slip. And on the back side, it says uh, when the deposit was made, the date, and then the, the signature of the borrower. So this is the signature of Charles Brockton Brown. And on the front, it where it's been scratched out, it says the title of the book he borrows was Description of the Scurial. All right. So Jim may talk a little bit about that later, if, if time permits. Well, I can do it now. I can Go for talk, it. About, <laughs> talk about it quickly. Um, um, so Charles Brockton Brown, famous novelist, uh, in 1794, when he borrowed this book, um, had not yet written, but he would later in 1805 publish uh, what he called then a fragment um, called Memoirs of Carwin, the Biloquist. And Carwin was a, one of these uh, strange Charles and Brockton Brown characters. His characteristic was that he was a ventriloquist. He could throw his voice and he used that capacity to for all kinds of good and bad <laughs> uh, um, ends. <laughs> so um, why was he interested in the Escorial? Well, um, in that book, which we have, of course, um, you can find a description of the Escorial and also of the great altar of the, of the chapel there, which celebrates uh, St. Lawrence. And um, so in the Memoirs of Carwin, uh, Brown describes this chapel and the stairs leading up to it, to the ark that contains the, the, um, the uh, relics of St. Lawrence, who was roasted on a, on a gridiron. That's what he's famous for. <laughs> um, so I think that Brown read this description of the Escorial was probably even drafting this so-called fragment um, oh, 15 years before it was published. Um, but um, referring to the picture, did you take a picture of the picture in the in the? No, no you didn't. No. Well, it's a. Um, you can show it during the open. Uh, house. I can show it. <laughs> like, come, for, come to the open house, and you can see what Charles Brockton Brown looked at when he was envisioning 
his hero Carlin at the uh, in the chapel of the um, the Escorial. Yes, that was such a fun fun rabbit hole to <laughs> go down yesterday. All right. So uh, if anyone is wondering why there are there strips cut out of the pages, that is also a spot where the borrower's signature um, would have appeared. And I believe when they returned the book, the librarian would would cut that out and kind of uh, round out the, the transaction. Well, and then so you'd see what's left showing are only the people who were delinquent. <laughs> That's right. That's my favorite thing about this. I never got to. So, right. So you can see here, if you can read that, that Casper Wister failed to return his book um, in 1794. <laughs> <laughs> we know about you, Casper. This is a book on apoplexy. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Maybe he really needed it. <laughs> okay, so now we're getting into some collection highlights uh, from, from the Loganian Library. This is um, a lot of what's interesting to me and hopefully to others about Logan's collection was all that was known about how he acquired these books, uh, specifically the people who owned them before he did and how those previous owners responded to the books by writing in the margins, uh, writing on the, on the title page and kind of making their understanding of, of the text known through their marginalia in various annotations. So this uh, is a book that was published in 1670 in Germany and it's basically a sort of resource for uh, understanding mechanical arts and arts and sciences. And it is in, in Latin. We know that uh, it once belonged to Francis Daniel Pastorius, who was the founder of Germantown. Uh, he lived from 1651 to 1720. And you can see that Pastorius signed his name um, at the bottom of the frontispiece or title page, and then added mottos around the margins that may or may not respond to, to the illustrations here. But what this book is most well known for is this opening here. So it shows what look like illustrations of leaves around the margins of the pages. And these were uh, prints that were added to the book by Pastorius himself using a technique called leaf printing or nature printing, where you simply take a leaf and apply ink, a thin layer of ink to either side, and then you uh, press it between two side, two sheets of paper and apply pressure. And you get a really nice crisp um, print of, of the leaf. So it looks like Pastorius was simply playing around with techniques of nature printing on this page. And you can see if you look left and right that the leaves on either side of the opening correspond to one another. They're mirror images of one another, which speak to the technique. What I didn't realize uh, was that Pastorius chose this particular opening um, because he is responding to the text in this section of the book, which had to do with writing and printing. And he is proposing a sort of uh, alternate, whoops, uh -oh, if we can go back to that. There we go. I'll let you take it from there. Okay. Yeah, there, well, there I mean, there are two things going on here. The first of which, um, we at the library company have always known about, and which is when I was introduced to this book, I was, I was told this is the point of it, that Pastorius was um, doing this nature printing that Pastorius was doing, which involves just inking leaves, as, as Emily says, and then closing the book, um, was um, inspired Franklin and his good friend Joseph Brightnell to start making nature prints and leaves for, um, for basically English botanists. Um, so Brightnell's nature prints which were many of which were sent to uh, back overseas to botanists to allow them to uh, try to describe American plants scientifically. Um, but, uh, and then we have uh, the ones that Brightnell kept, which is one of our great treasures, the, the Brightnell leaf prints. 
but uh, and they also inspired Franklin probably in Bright Knoll to um, make a different kind of leaf print, which was uh, cast in, uh, made by pressing a leaf into a, a plaster of Paris mold and then making a, a tight metal uh, printing surface from that. And they used these leaf prints to, among other things, um, to print uh, paper money. And their leaf print was supposed to be a counterfeit return. So that's all. That's all well and good, but it was only actually uh, many, many years after I'd been here for many years that I um, took a close look. Actually, uh, I had this book on display in, in, in the in the an exhibition, our exhibition gallery, in about I think nineteen ninety nine or two thousand, and um, a, a, a woman came in and said, "You realize that this is a kind of of um, cryptography." Yeah. No, I didn't realize that. I said, we'll read the Latin. Okay, well, let's, let's read the Latin. If you are a Loganian library user, you can read Latin, right? So it basically says something like, um, this is a way of writing using leaves. And um, so you imagine that, it, then you can almost make it out the B, and the second line up from the bottom, beta B. That means a beet leaf means B. And then you can see crocus C, and that, a crocus Blossom, and I think that's a crocus blossom on the left. And if you can move uh, half three quarters of the way up, oh yeah, I think yes. that's what that is. Yeah. Um, so the, the crocus is a C. I don't know which one is a, a beet leaf, but um, it, but there are plenty of possibilities there. So th so this is a way of making a kind of of um, cryptogram of of uh, you could spell words by lining up these letters, and 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 I thought, well, this is really very ingenious because. Um, first of all, nobody looking at this would be, would even guess that it was supposed to be a text. Mm. Um, but also, you'd have to know your beats and your crocuses pretty well. <laughs> so it's it's very clever. But then the next, the third thing that I noticed really only very recently is also on this page, along with um, information about about engraving, chalkography, and printing, and um, other these other arts and sciences that the that the book is um, supposed to summarize very briefly is um, steganography, which is um, is a fairly technical word and from the, from the Renaissance of of a way of of embedding a text um, not just with 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 a, a normal cryptogram you've got um, you've got letters. And you know it's a text, but you can't read it. And you have to have the key. You have to know that this letter means is translated into that letter. Um, but this is a this is a stegono steganography, which is where you don't even know that it's a text. And so it's a, in the sense it's much much more uh, difficult cryptogram to to crack <laughs> because you don't even know it's there to begin with. And I've I've recently found out that in the online world, steganography is used to describe any kind of of, um, of uh, text uh, encoded into another text, so that you don't realize that the 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 the, the, earth, <laughs> the, 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 the <laughs> prima facie text is, looks like a regular text, but in, but if you can get into the code, you can find another text encoded in there, and that's now called steganography. So the word has come back, and the technique <laughs> has come back, and so this makes this. This opening in this book, these two pages, um, to be almost like a whole um, archaeology of mm. of um, a steganography, a gateway to steganography. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I suppose too. You'd have to have some dried plant material around to do this with. Otherwise, you have seasonal limitations as to when you could mm. yes. do the printing. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the, all the leaf Good prints point. that Brightnell did, uh, and this one too, probably Brightnell describes how he had to dry them and. Um, and it was, you had to do it just the right way in order to make a good impression. It was not, not as easy as just inking it and slapping it. <laughs> How is this connected to Logan? Well, uh, Logan bought this book as well. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we talking about this? <laughs> we digress. <laughs> it's good stuff, mm -hmm. though, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, Logan bought uh, this book as, along with at least four others uh, from Pastorius' sons um, in around 1720. Okay. And Logan probably showed it to Bright Knoll and Franklin ah, before 1730, cool. yeah. which is when they started, um, well, after 1730, when they started playing around with the leaf print. Okay. 
Okay. So the, the provenance on, on the book you see here on the screen is at least three individuals deep. Uh, we know the, the three past owners are James Logan, Johann Albert Fabricius, and Johann Fredericus Granovius. Uh, this is a copy of Ptolemy that was published in 1538. And it's Ptolemy's most important astronomical and mathematical work. So this book, I think, was, was sent to Logan as a gift from one of his correspondents, a, a professor named Fabricius, who was a classical scholar and bibliographer who served as a professor of rhetoric and ethics at Hamburg. He was in frequent correspondence with Logan, and this was not the only book that he sent them. But it's, it's important and it's interesting because it bears the annotations of all of its former owners. So the title page itself is, I believe, marked up by, by all three of those individuals. And we have a close-up. We can move us off the screen. Yeah, it can scoot us over there. So we have a close-up of the inscription from 1722, where Fabricius sent this book and dedicated it to uh, the Philadelphian James Logan, and then the date 1722. This, is, this book is a really good example of how um, the kind of, of scholarship that Logan um, was, was performing in Philadelphia in the 1720s, 30s, 40s, um, was uh, was reflected uh, a con mostly really continental, not just not just transatlantic, but continental kind of of erudition, which um, um, was done by a very close knit, fairly small group of men, and that Logan was um, probably the only, or maybe only one of two um, Americans who were part of this network of, of scholarship and. They have communicated with each other by this process of annotation. So and the annotations are not just, uh, this is what I think about this, so I'll remember it the next time, which I guess is what we think of our annotations, but it was mm -hmm. meant to be something that you could then transmit to other people that were part of this close knit community. Without the aid of cryptography. Without, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is an edition of Euclid's work on geometry that was published in Rome in 1594. And uh, it is an edition that is in the Arabic language and demonstrates Logan's uh, knowledge of Arabic language and his ability to write at that as well. I think we have a close up of, is this his translation of the title page? Is it? So, yeah, so um, in the in the in the Latin Renaissance, the Western European Renaissance, everybody knew Latin, but Greek, um, at least in the in, for a, a crucial period of time during the late Middle Ages, Greek was not commonly known by these Western Europeans. Um, but in the Arabic world, um, you know, these Greek texts also circulated, and they tended to get uh, translated into Arabic. For the use of Arabic scholars. And um, so this is the way that many of the Greek classics were transmitted to the Latin, um, European, Western European, Latin world, Latin Middle Ages um, through, through Arabic translations. So this is why it's really interesting um, for in the 16th century for the, um, the, the papal press in Rome, which had Arabic um, type, to reprint one of these Arabic manuscripts of a translation of Euclid from the Greek. So I hope that makes sense anyway. <laughs> um, so, but Logan, so Logan is using this um, because he's fascinated with, with the transmission of classical texts, um, mm -hmm. but also because he's he wants to learn Arabic but to go along with all the other languages. And, mm -hmm. and what he's done here is um, he's, he's written out a passage um, and so we know that he could write Arabic, which is, you know, that's pretty amazing right there. And he could read it, 
but also uh, he would correct it because he found mistakes. It was just, <laughs> so typically Logan, he found mistakes in the in the either the printing or the translation mm -hmm. of the Arabic. I don't know which, because he also, of course, by now, in the in the eighteenth century, had um, had the Greek text of, of Euclid to work with, and so he's interested in how this text um, changed over over the years, mm -hmm. and and then he's finding mistakes or misprints. I'm not sure which. Um, and marking the margins of his margin, his marginalia had margins <laughs> where, he, <laughs> where he's recording the corrections to be made. So okay. it's a real tour de force of, of um, linguistic brilliance. Yeah. On Logan's part. And one we'll come back to, I think, in the in the final book in a couple of slides. So moving on. The next two books we're going to show um, are grouped together because they also share a, an interesting and important provenance. This is a, a German book from 1702, which had to do with, with scientific and astronomical instruments. Um, and we know that it once belonged to the astronomer and mystic Johann Jacob Zimmermann, who, having predicted the coming millennium, prepared to immigrate to Pennsylvania with a group of German pietists to await that happy event. So Zimmerman actually died on the night before they were set to make the passage to America. And his books, his wife and his family went, as well as the other German pietists, and his books uh, went along with them and lived with uh, one of the German pietists named Johann Kelpius in uh, the German town section of Philadelphia, um, and also sometimes in a cave. Well, it's in Fairmount Park. Uh, for, still you know, there. For, in Philadelphia. It's a cave, it's still there. <laughs> Something cave-like. Anyway. And, uh, and yeah, so they were called the Hermits of the Wissahickon, or the Society of the Woman of the Wilderness, and they were... Um, they really were pretty convinced the world was coming to an end and they wanted to be <laughs> here to see it and to <laughs> observe it um, using, um, you know, as a phenomenon of, of the planets or the spheres. So I believe they used some of these, these books, the works on, on astronomy to help determine the best date for them to travel yeah. to, to America. Um, so this is just one of the books that, that was useful to them in that regard. It looks like it had a, a owner prior to Zimmerman um, and the name Smith appears down here in the lower corner. So Logan bought this and nine other astronomical works uh, from Zimmerman's widow in 1708 and making up his first major American purchase. One of kind of the superstars of the Loganian Library collections is this edition of Isaac Newton's Principia, which was printed in 1687. For a long time, this was thought to be among the first group of books that Logan imported to America and thought it was just that within his first order. Um, but only recently, within the past few years, a scholar named Tony Grafton was looking closely at all of the books in, in Logan's core group of books, looking at the, the inscriptions and annotations and the various date, dates that appeared. And he was able to connect this book to the uh, to the Zimmerman acquisition as well. And he did that in two ways. So on the title page, actually, I'll skip to the next slide. You see the date, April 1708, which is the month and year in which uh, Logan made the purchase from Zimmerman's widow of the rest of the books from the mystical hermits. And then on the bottom of page 60, there is a notation in Latin in a German hand followed by a notation from Logan himself uh, talking about how he responded to, to the German notation. And so to Tony Grafton, that there were two pieces of evidence now that could tie this book 
to that group of books that Logan bought from, from Zimmerman's family. I'm not sure if I can go back. I wanted to point out one more thing um, on a feature of this book is right next to the title page, there's about two pages, two or three pages of Logan's notes. And he gives that section a title, um, which I'm not going to read, it's in Latin, but it translates to something like eluc elucidation of certain difficulties. So he's reading through Newton's book on uh, laws of gravity and laws, laws of motion and kind of working through um, the principles and coming up with his own interpretation of them. Yeah, I mean, this, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at a, a Xerox now. <laughs> this thing. It's not the real thing itself. Um, where, I mean, one of the things that's going on in, the, in Newton's Principia is that he's basically, um, he's um, formulating the science of calculus. And, um, and this is, I mean, I, you know, I took calculus once, the most difficult thing I ever <laughs> took. So it's a very, very, um, it's hard to understand. And even when it was just, just taking shape as a branch of mathematics in the, in the 17th century, it was especially hard for people to understand. And Logan now is taking the, this whole book. It's a thick book. I'll just show you. This is this is the book. It's not a pamphlet. <laughs> and and boiling it down to one page of formulas, um, and uh, calling it. It was this is an elucidation of the difficult parts of this famously most difficult book that had ever been written up to that point. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, what can I say? This man's ego was was unbelievable, but also his brilliance <laughs> was the same. Can you hand me that book again? I want to make one other point about it. So if you can see this at all, you'll see that it's in what is probably a contemporary uh, European binding um, vellum covers. Yeah, and, another clue, by the way, that this didn't come from London, um, but rather from a, from Germany, which is where Zimmerman came. Right. So sadly, when the when the books, the Loganian Library was moved to the Ridgeway Building at Broad and Christian Streets, there was a pretty large scale campaign to shore up the books and, and restore them for the presentation in, in their new home. So as we mentioned, they were behind wire cages and they were gonna be visible to the public. So they wanted them to look as, as good as they could. And so the best binders in Philadelphia, Pawson and Nicholson were hired to rebind the books, uh, rebind all of the ones that need it. Um, in half Morocco or reback the ones whose boards had become detached. So Jim was holding up an example of one of the books. Um, this is the one with the leaves in it. This is the one with the leaves in it <laughs> that was rebound. So this is this is what's called actually quarter Morocco. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's you know a tough a tough loss for the Loganian Library collection. When things are, when books are restored um, during that time period, they would have removed a lot of the end papers, which probably would have had more notes from, from Logan on them, as well as just the material evidence that the original binding can provide. All right, we are almost at 1230. You have one more book to show you, and we hope to have a little bit of time for, for questions and answers. So what we have here on the screen are the title pages of two books that were bound together into one volume. One of them is the Paris 1516 edition of Euclid's work on geometry, and the other is the Venice 1515 edition of Ptolemy's Almagest. Now, what's interesting about these, oh, they're very important books, of course, but they formed part of Logan's original collection. And that's a collection of 700 to 900 books that he formed as a young man, I think beginning at the age of, of 12, if that tells you anything. He developed this collection of several hundred books, uh, which he ended up selling in his early 20s in an effort to fund 
um, a business idea he had to get into the textile trade. So uh, that didn't go so well. <laughs> he he wasn't successful with the textile trade and he lost his library, at which point uh, he was picked up by William Penn and asked to come to America and built his new collection. So um, the, if there was one book that he always missed from his original library, it was this compilation of two books bound together. And there's a really um, wonderful letter that he wrote to a Quaker merchant in Dublin, trying to seek that person's help in finding this long lost volume and trying to get it back. So he wrote to that merchant in 1726, in January of the, that year, he wrote, I am further to request another favor, which I hope will not give thee too much trouble. It is this, in the year 1698, I sold a considerable quantity of books, about seven or 800 and mostly old, to a bookseller who lived, and then he goes on to describe the very precise location uh, where the bookseller was in Dublin, down a number of streets, how many left turns you had to make, and so on. He says, among ye ref refuse, there was a very old volume in folio containing Euclid's elements in Latin by Campanus and a Latin translation of Ptolemy's Almagest done out of Arabic printed at Venice near the year 1500 in what is called the Old English Black Letter. If that shop be kept by the same person or by any of his children, heirs, or former apprentices, or if any other bookseller has bought his stock upon his decease, and it is not very improbable, but that the same book may be found among ye rubbish. Now, if thou couldst employ any proper person to inquire and search for it, the procuring of it would very much oblige me. The value of it is small, scarce five shillings, yet I would be willing to give considerably more for it. And here he says why he was so desperate to get this book back. It's neither Euclid's nor Ptolemy's works that I want because I already have both, but it is that individual book I crave upon occasion of some letters that have passed between the learned Albertus Fabricius, professor at Hamburg, and me concerning Latin transla translation of Ptolemy from Arabic, about which we do not agree. So basically, Logan wanted this book back so badly because he wanted to settle uh, a disagreement or an argument with Fabricius about whether or not an Arabic edition of Ptolemy had ever existed. An Arabic, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just 13 months later, uh, the Quaker merchant Forbes delivered. He followed Logan's instructions and then some and uh, sent him the, the very book. And Logan wrote him a really nice thank you note, as, as one should always do. He wrote, after I had wrote and sent away my last to thee, I could not but reflect on my own hardiness in imposing a task on thee that must be so very doubtful in your success as to hunt out an old book that I had parted with in so large a city eight and 20 years before. Yet now I was prompted to it by a more happy genius than common sense could also suffer one to imagine, for thou hast found the very book I wanted for thy care and trouble in which I return thee my most hearty thanks. <laughs> so he was gracious. Or could be. Could be <laughs> in this moment. <laughs> so that is our last book. And one oh. other very important yes. the title page. <laughs> feature of this book is uh, the title page you see on the left. So when Logan um, received this book back into his care, uh, the title page for the Euclid um, was missing or perhaps had never been there. Yeah, I think even when he had it, the, the title page, I think he described it as one of the ways you could tell if it's the right book is that it's the Euclid's lacking the title page. Okay, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So he commissioned his friend Benjamin Franklin to create a new title page, which looks nothing like the original did, but, you know, um, represents Franklin's work. And Franklin delivered uh, this title page to him at, at Stenton. So um, 
Well, and just how would you, would that mean that the book was unbound to get the title page properly or they just, Franklin would have tipped it in, just kind of glued it, it in. Yeah. Okay. So I think that is it for our romp through the Loganian Library. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are, if, if we still have people with us, I know it's 134, we'd be happy to uh, spend a few minutes answering your questions. Sure. Yeah, and we have we have quite some we have some questions that came in kind of early in the um, in the chat. Um, some about the busts that were in some of the images of the library. I don't know if you want to if you can call that to mind or you know the busts that are still probably the some of the same ones that are still out here. Um, some of them, but not all of them. This um, <laughs> so. I know this is not the question that's being asked, but yes, we still have a lot of, of busts and they're uh, mostly of um, reasonably famous people. I mean, Benjamin Rush, Milton, you know, Shakespeare, people like that, uh, <laughs> and Franklin himself. But um, but there's also, I mean, the painting and of, of James Logan um, was sitting on a mantle in, um, in the Loganian Library room in 1731, I think it was. Um, when the fireplace caught on fire, and that destroyed the painting uh, by the the great colonial artist Hestelius, um, and also destroyed a bust of William Penn by Sylvanus Bevan. So those were two sort of major works of art that were that were burned up in that unfortunate fire. Which, mm. by the way, um, I believe happened because. Um, we were burning this new thing called they were uh, they were burning this new thing called uh, anthracite coal oh. in a fireplace that was only meant <laughs> to burn uh, the much uh, cooler burning bituminous coal, and so the fireplace actually caught on the mantelpiece caught oh, on fire because oh, wow. of the heat of the the heat of the fire and also also the heat I suppose of the, the library company's annual meeting which was going on that weekend. <laughs> So, I know it's that's not, not heated. I know that's not the question that you asked. But yes, we have lots of uh, come to come to the library company at 1314 Locust, and you'll see a whole lot of busts, even another bust of William Penn, <laughs> but not the Sylvanus Bedman. There's there's a question. How how did the Logan Logan Library become the Loganian Library? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has to do with the Latin. It's just Latin. Yeah. Yeah. Um and uh, also, I think referring to some of those early images in the talk, only men were allowed. I mean, we did see this Brewster, but someone says, is that a, a, a woman in the far back left? Were there points at which only men were part of the, admitted in the um, I, I wonder if there was a woman in that, in that uh, watercolor of the interior in of the, the Cooper. Library. The, okay. Yeah, it was. There, there were certainly, certainly women using the library yeah. at, at that point. I think yeah. as as early as what the earliest uh, woman shareholder was was in the mid eighteenth century, seventeen sixty nine. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first woman shareholder, but um, but there's also some indications in our minutes, which are not very informative on these things, that um, that women were uh, borrowing books, could borrow books from the library using their husbands or their brothers or some male. Yeah relatives share so um so it's not clear that there was ever a, a prohibition against women you know crossing the sacred threshold of the library company but but it was um difficult for the first 30 years or so of the library for um, women to to use, to use them. In, the, in the time that those watercolors were made in the, in the 18 I guess it been, uh, 1880s there was actually um well after the the we left the old Lugania, the old library and built our new building. The new building, the one on uh, Boca Street, the one where all the modern books was, had a women's special reading room for women. Oh yes, yeah, um, we have photographs so, of that. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I don't, I think, was meant. Um, I don't know that that's exactly a compliment to the women of the time that they had to be kept <laughs> separate from the men, but or a compliment to the men either. But in any case, there was at least enough of an acknowledgement that the women using the library that they felt they had to. Have a, a women's give their own space. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question about um, from whom Logan was purchasing his books. Did he use a particular bookseller in London? And I know there were multiple booksellers. 
yeah, he um, he believes that there were a, there were a group of maybe half a dozen London booksellers who knew the, the kind of books he wanted, who knew the, what they were worth and um, and what they were, and they were the they were the um, the booksellers who supplied learned libraries and and erudite collectors like him. Maybe six of them, and they're all pretty well known um, for other things as well. And related to that, um, another person's wanting to know when he purchased books from different countries, how did he know what he wanted to buy? Did he have someone scouting for him? Um, he did. He was able to get some books through this network of friends like Fabricius and Gernovius on the continent. Um, and they helped him. They helped him find some books. But but the normal way for him was by patronizing booksellers who knew this material and could find them and knew what the books should cost. And he knew the books existed because they were old books he had yeah. learned about in the distant past yeah. and he was yeah. on a quest. Yeah, I mean, this, this, the, the, re, the, the rejoining of his long lost um, Euclid and Ptolemy is a perfect example. He knew, mm -hmm. he knew the books, in most cases, he knew the books that he wanted. And he just had to find somebody who knew where to get them. Where to get them, and that's what the, the Wolf catalog of Edwin Wolf's catalog of the Lovinian Library, which transcribes so many of these letters, mm -hmm. show that he um, he didn't just write down his idol, find me this book. He would go on a whole little disquisition about the book, and you know it shouldn't cost more than five shillings, and it's <laughs> and you'll find that <laughs> whatever. Yeah, so he, <laughs> very very luminous letters about. The books he wanted. And in many cases, he was looking for a certain edition. So he had to make it very clear. I'm not quite sure I remember the, the year, but it's not the, the edition of, of 1580, because that's no good. You want the edition of 1520 or whatever. So. <laughs> um, someone is asking, was Logan's one of the first private libraries to or be organized by subject and cataloged in early America? We often think of Jefferson's, which was later. How does the early Logan catalog relate to the library company's own efforts at cataloging? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, the, the, the Norris catalog is a lot more like the Jefferson catalog because um, Jefferson had his books shown uh, by subjects. And then and what in the Jefferson catalog is just a matter of writing down the spine titles of the books in the shelves, shelf by shelf. And that's basically what Norris did. Um, you know, in earlier in 1742, but the library company didn't um, didn't shelve books by subject until the 1880s. But around the time that the the, the second library, the Juniper Street Library building was was built, um, everything was reorganized um, by subject, and um, and that was over a century after Logan. It's a century after Jefferson and even more after Logan arranged their books that way. And I think the main reason we didn't do it is because it was just too darn hard mm -hmm. to take everything off the shelves and put it back in a whole different place. And the, the moving of books from uh, one building to another provided that opportunity. And so they took advantage of it. Well, and that gets to um, another question about, um, and Emily and I were talking about this a little bit earlier today too, are the Loganian, is the Loganian library physically together now? And you were talking about the transformation yeah. by Edmund Wolf. And... Right, that's a change that I was curious about as well. It seems to have been kept together as a collection um, only up until the closure of the Ridgeway building on, right. on Broad Street. And in our current location was integrated into the broader collections According to uh, certain bibliographies, and as well as uh, its or its century of, of publication, so we have we have a collection of 16th century books and 17th century books in which the Loganian Library, you know, features largely. Um, so you can see. Um, I don't know, is this going to work? Maybe. So what this book is now is the, the classification of this book now is Sev, which is a 17th century book. It's Sev and Pexa, P-E-X-E, the first four letters of the author's name. But you can see um, on the book plate, this is going to work. You can see the old classification from the 1880s, which is um, I-B. Um, and um, 
followed by an accession number, 626. So the call number went from ID 626 to Sev Hexi. <laughs> That's progress for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I was wondering too, Jim, if you could say something about the book plates too, because in, isn't it that there's a James Logan book plate that actually belongs to James Logan Jr.? Right. And yeah. then it's William Logan who also had a book plate commissioned for the Loganian Library. Is that right? Is and that the right? two are kind of related. Yeah. This, um, yeah. So James Logan, if you ever come across a book with James Logan's book plate, um, and this has happened surprisingly uh, many times over the course of my career here, people say, I found a book that belonged to James Logan. It's got his book plate. Well, James Logan, the original James Logan, never used a book plate. And actually, um, and so, so yes, yeah, so it was it was William who commissioned a book a book plate to be engraved for the Loganian Library, and then James used a version of that for his own personal library as well. Is that mm -hmm. how it works, Laura? I can't remember exactly. But yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, we have so many questions, and some of them are very mm -hmm. specific, um, like. I'm assuming due to Logan's Quaker principles, there were no performing arts books in his library, which. No, I mean, there's, there's plays. The I'm plays. Sorry. I mean, Spanish, but. <laughs> <laughs> they were the books in Spanish. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think in looking actually in the, in the manuscript catalog, I did, I wrote a whole section of, of opera and I wasn't sure if, if oh, I was. Works. 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 Latin, okay, right. that's what I, what was it? But, was afraid of. but Logan, I mean, you know, I don't know, it's questionable just how orthodox a Quaker Logan was anyway, because, you know, he was, he was of the party that believed um, that the de defensive war was okay, war and self-defense was okay, and which was a, 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 in the 1740s when he was taking this position was not a incredibly popular position among Quakers, but um, and related to this catalog, there's a question that says you showed two pages from the Norris catalog. On the left hand page, the entries are numbered in a column at the left. Oh, I didn't finish reading it and I think it got it got pulled away. But someone's just asking about the, the format of the why are some entries numbered and, and others some are not? not. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I see. I think probably um, it, on some pages, the catalog um, is is doing uh, something that librarians call analytics. It's it's giving an actual uh, contents of the book. So um, oh. and the numbers on the right, I think maybe this is what we saw. Numbers on the right are the page numbers where you find that section of the, mm -hmm. of the book, um, and then on the far right are the are the dates. Sometimes on, on other pages. It's the date of publication, um, but yeah, and I'm looking at one now where, and here's a here's a a, a, a volume that has several numbered sections, and they and, and within it and they're numbered. And, oh, okay, and here's one where they are numbering them sequentially. Right. Okay. So some of the sections, like the so the Libri Reiki, the Greek books are are numbered, um, and it's possible that Logan um, had them numbered, that had numbered them for his own reference, so that he could find them easily. Yeah. But yeah, good question. I hadn't given that a whole lot of thought. What's going? On? What is going on here? Yeah, but, and this one also um, were the numbers in the Norris catalog key to some kind of physical shelf list. Mm -hmm. I wondered about that. Yeah, don't know. It's yeah, a, you know, it's very likely. Um, but And then this is a question quite specific to printing, um, more of an observation. The Franklin Euclid title page is fascinating and looks like something Baskerville would have printed. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. I mean, this is what an 18th century um, edition of a, of a Latin classic would have looked like, or a Greek classic would look like not. A, a 16th century edition. And um, yeah, and it needs to say it looks absolutely nothing like the original. <laughs> and are these books valuable today? Would someone like J.P. Morgan have wanted them back in the day? I guess meaning his day, <laughs> J.P. Morgan's day. Well, the, 
so the Newton Principia is, um, uh, I can't remember. I mean, you see them, they come up for sale every once in a while and in the mid six figures, I guess I would say. But, so yeah, some of them are incredibly valuable. Some of them are, um, are worth hardly anything at all, um, you know, even today. Not the ones we're showing you here. All the ones we're showing you here would be, would be, um, would be very hard to anyone to afford today. But there are also there are a lot of uh, books that Logan, Logan was not a, a <coughs> Logan was was a, not a bibliophile in the sense that we usually use that word. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in first editions. He just wanted best editions, and best was according to his idea of what the best edition was and, and the information that it contained. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have just a series of, of kind of quick responses in some respects to some of the this, um, the slides um, related to the promissory note. I think we really addressed that by discussing that the, the signature would get kind of cut out. Um, and then on the, I think this is a reference to our brick book, um, on the, <laughs> on the pages with the mirror images of leaves, the bottom left obliterates or replaces the images from the right. Was there, or was there space for notes? Hmm. So there was that one, one bit that seemed a little asymmetrical at the bottom. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a whole sequence of. In fact, I see the crocus there again. Um, that doesn't uh, print on the other side. Yeah, good eye, whoever asked that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, presumably, he just put another piece of paper in there and um, and covered it up. Covered it up, so, so it didn't transfer. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is um, also a good one from the same person. When notations are added to the page of a book, was the entire book shipped back and forth? Was the notation meant to be shared? So this is part of that kind of community of yeah. annotating. Mm -hmm. And how did you? How did that? Did well, that in the case happen? of the Fabricius book, it actually did cross the Atlantic, but that wasn't a normal um, situation. No, I think it, normally you would make the annotation, and then, um, well, so if it's a kind of annotation where you're actually, uh, uh, you know, correcting mistakes or something like that, then it would be possible to write a letter to somebody saying, in your edition of of this book on page 276, line 14, you'll see that there's a misprint of this or that. So it's it's a way of transmitting information. You don't necessarily have to ship the whole book around to, to do it. And then in other cases, it was just long, long, long letters. A lot of Logan's letters to booksellers are bibliographic essays, really, that are that are based in part on his annotations that he's using to, to um, um, Find more books. <laughs> <laughs> well, and before we sign off, Jim, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the dis dissolution of the Loganian Library as an mm -hmm. entity unto itself and kind of when and why and how that all transpired. Um, so Edwin Wolf in the preface to his catalog um, um, gives a very good explanation of what we know and what we don't know about what was going on. But um, Logan and Isaac Norris had a falling out towards the end of Logan's life. Isaac was supposed to be um, one of the trustees of the library. Logan wrote him out of the will. Um, a lot of, there were changes made to the will and it left it ambiguous. And um, so when the lawyers got to it, it was, it took a long time to, to, to straighten out, make sure they knew exactly, um, or they could agree on, on a, a a formulation of all Logan's various um, um, wills. Um, for example, the thing about that the librarian had to be someone who could cite, read Latin and Greek is something that these these rules, you know, if you're going to take them seriously, you should at least agree on what the text was going to be on all of them. Um, in later times, I'll digress a little bit here. In later times, um, the the um, the idea that the librarian should be a Logan descendant has fallen into disuse. The last Loganian descendant that we had on our board of directors was uh, uh, Captain John Cadwallader, who was uh, who resigned the board shortly before he died, and that was in 1994. So we did a pretty good, spent a long time trying to keep Logan family members on the board of directors. Um, but the, very early on, uh, the idea that the librarian should be a Logan descendant and should be someone who could cite read Latin and Greek um, went by the boards. And um, and so the, 
the librarian that um, we saw in the painting a while ago, Lloyd Smith, I think it was Lloyd Smith's, one of his children, Logan Pearsall Smith, um, who said that um, that he could, he was a, he was living in England at the time. He said that he was, if he ever was out of a job, he could always go back to Philadelphia and become a librarian, <laughs> the hereditary <laughs> librarian of the library company. And he said, and it was supposedly, uh, he was supposed to be able to, to sight read Greek and Latin, but um, but now it's just enough to be able to say you've forgotten how to. <laughs> I'll remember so, that. <laughs> but at the time, at the time in the 1750s, um, when all this was being hashed out, the um, all of these expressions of Logan's will were taken very seriously, and when they were in kind of conflict, they had to be resolved. Now. So that postponed the whole process of of um, putting the library into the building on Sixth Street. So, the, but the dissolution of the library which happened in the 1790s was mostly due to the fact that the Logan descendants didn't want to be the Logan librarian. And, um, and the, the library had been closed, uh, almost almost entirely closed for the, um, not just during the Revolutionary War, but before and after it. So in 1792, the Logan family um, representatives requested uh, the, uh, a merger with the library company. And, that's how that's how that came about, and that was, um, and and that's why we that's why we added on to our building on Fifth Street almost immediately after finishing it because this process seeing seeing what we were doing seeing what an active library it was compared to the early more of the Bulgarian library probably helped the Logan family decide that they wanted it to be part of the library. Okay. Well, we should. Um... Clearly state that the open house is on December 1st, Thursday, December 1st, and it's one to three, correct? I think we're, we're saying one to two. Oh, one to two. Okay. No, we might be clearly, persuaded to clearly, stay. Clearly stay it's one to two. But maybe. <laughs> I'll be there uh, with the books we showed during our slideshow today and, and probably a few more and Jim will be there. Laura, and I hope well, you can, I can, I can join you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah, and, and I think that is our, our final Books Are My Disease event. Um, so thank so you, thank everyone, you for, for coming out today. Yes, everyone who's tuned in. Tuning in. <laughs> thank you all. All right. And we thank hope you, to see Emily, you Emily, for um, our MC. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. And slideshow. <laughs> yeah, thank you both for sharing your, your knowledge. This has been fun. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>